Hello, everybody. This is my first time actually hosting Bryce onto my show today. And um, welcome to Spiritual Perspectives of Our Great Awakening. I am so excited because we have Cindy coming onto the show today. And we are going to talk about Hathor. How are you guys doing today? Good. That was the same before we started filming. This is now my second time filming from a bedroom from a bed <laughs> so if you see my camera wobbling about it's because it's on a pillow um, i'm still not in atlanta so we're just making do with what we have but i'm super excited i got back in time to do this episode with you ladies yeah and how are you cindy i'm doing good i'm here at the yoga studio taught a class earlier this morning and uh i was reading up i was preparing too i love uh you know talking about hathor and was reading up a little bit before we uh got on today so yay <laughs> yay so i just started reading a little bit about hathor in the um sophia code book i'm currently um reading through that right now and ever so slowly i'm reading through it during my busy work schedule and everything but i really wanted to start you know covering more of like the goddesses and everything like that because they're so twisted you know uh the way that the powers that be have portrayed them um and so i think it's important that we understand just what um these ascended masters um did their importance a little bit of their background and everything so uh the audience understands that you know there's a bigger picture in all of this so um with that said cindy i will let you take the wheel on hathor Oh my gosh. <laughs> well, I also, uh, I have the, the book, the Sophia Code, I actually have it here with me as well. <laughs> and I love the way that uh, she talks about Hathor in this book. Uh, in my experience in working with Hathor, the first time I really worked with her, I felt like she just came in and rearranged my whole entire I feel that the part of her essence or her magic, her mastery, um, you know, it goes, it goes through many realms, but for us as humans, it's learning how to master our human body and to awaken it, not just everything that the human body entails. I mean, our human body is nothing but pure energy. And in the Sophia Code, Half the world talks about how we're made up of electrons and bright. I've talked about that. I think we had that conversation before on, on your channel. And understanding that our body is this quantum thing and how powerful it is, how powerful our body is, how powerful our voice is. And, um, when, uh, like I said, when I worked with Half the World, I, I think it was last fall. I mean, I really felt like it, it was it was a, a really intense experience, though. It was um, right after I had gotten sick with, I don't know how y'all how feel the idea. It's a beer flu. The beer, the beer bug. Yeah. Um, and I had gone through, you know, my, my body had gone through like this major fever. And this major cleanse. And when I had that, you know, I had a fever and uh, I had started my my period at the same time. Like, so I was wow. in this major, major, I don't know what you call it, just detox mode. And I kept seeing also like just a lot of things, the, the flower of life, you know, the sacred geometry on the flower of life. Mm -hmm. That kept coming in a lot too. And again, it just felt like this very intense alchemical kind of experience through my body. But after that, like it, it lasted. And then there was this, a whole mental rearranging, I think, that happened as well with my mind. I mean, I went through this, um, it almost felt like a mini dark night. Like there was just emotional things that were, were coming up and then I thought that I had dealt with. You know how that happens, right? Mm -hmm. You think that you deal with something. And then it comes up like, come from so it was just this full spiraling like the spiraling inward but then eventually in a couple of weeks it subsided it passed and on the other side of that I had so much energy so much momentum so much motivation and like new information just new information kept coming in through that anyways I share that because that that's, that's what happened to me 
when working with half or I mean, I really did feel like I was rearranged, and, and I, I feel that that's largely part of, of what she does. And so she helps us to clear, cleanse our body, our mind, our throat, our hearts, our energetic system, so that we can be the clearest vessel as possible for our high self. But learning, like learning uh, the mastery over our body, too. Like true mastery over our bodies as as, uh, as sovereign beings, as manifestors, as uh, co-creators, and um, this is the, the, the whole process of understanding all the bits and details and the power that resides within our body, activating it to its fullest potential so that we can live our best life. Can we talk about the virus thing for a minute? Because this is something, Stephanie, I've spoken about, and this is something I cannot reiterate enough. Because here in the Western world, especially as of the last couple of years, I think we forgot, we forget the potency of viruses. They're not a bad thing. And in fact, in the East, they're, they're necessary. It's the burning away of, of the old samskara, of the old patterning. And you talked about that, like it's when you're able to see that. I mean, of course, it sucks when you're going through that. I mean, hello, who likes to be hanging their head over a toilet vomiting? Like it's not fun, you know, but there's a spiritual process that is happening. Uh, we've talked about this, Stephanie, when you can't, when you're, when you have these, these pathways throughout your physical body that are energetic. The energetic body is feeding that physical body. And that's where that bondage is happening through your own shit, basically your own, uh, your own mental bondage. And when you start to break down those patternings, especially old ones that have been around, you know, you might've inherited them from your ancestors, who knows, mm -hmm. it takes like a fire. It takes a virus. It takes something to come in to like, just, we have a joke with Guruji used to say like, oh, a new body is making, new body is making. But what he didn't tell you is the old body has to break first before the new one can make. Mm -hmm. And that's the same thing with energetic patternings is these old patterns have to burn up. And sometimes that results in a virus that results in a fever. Um, it's the same thing when you're on your period. It's that deep. And the fact that it happened all together with you, Cindy, Ugh. God, God is oh, well, a sense of humor with that one, right? That was rough. I want to add to that too, Bryce. Oh, sorry. I didn't. Sorry. Go ahead, Cindy. No, I was just responding to that. I mean, that was like, what the... <laughs> coming out of every hole right like every like literally every oh my god <laughs> <laughs> and oh. it's, it's interesting you you bring this up too because i i don't know if i've ever mentioned this on um my channel or, or yours bryce but back in um i would say middle of 2020 i hadn't fully awakened to this whole realization and reality of what exactly is going on. But I was, I was going through a period of time where I was like little by little. And I remember I'd wake up really, really, really early in the morning. Um, Cause you know, generally most people, if you're normal to some extent, you have a full bladder when you wake up, you gotta relieve yourself and, and not to get gross here, but I would like break out in a wicked fever that lasted maybe five minutes and I would get so weak that I'd fall on the ground. And I was getting concerned. It went away. But now looking back at it and knowing what I know now, I'm realizing that my body was upgrading. And it was allowing some old stuff to be released. And then the new to come on in now that I know better. And so the other thing that would happen is the ringing in the ears would happen. And then I would break out in a fever again. And I mean, it only lasted five to 10 minutes. It was the weirdest thing. And I did not understand it at the time because coming from the Western medical world that I was in to, to a regular doctor, that could be like a heart condition or you need to get this test done and that test done. And now that I know, especially thanks to Bryce, you know, you have taught me a lot about this stuff. Um, I realized that it was releasing of the old so the new could come in. And then it was weird because then I had a massive spiritual awakening after I went to the brunt of that because it was happening almost every morning. So. Mm. Yeah, I mean, our bodies are quite magnificent. And in the Magdalene teaches too, and, and even the, in the Hathor, because, you know, like Hathor, Isis, Magdalene, it's all the same the same lineage, 
but they talk about the body as, as the child, like your body is the holy grail. I mean, your body is the actual tower. You, you hold the bloodline of, of consciousness, of the highest consciousness. It's within your bloodline. And uh, the mastery of our body, I mean, that is how all these, these high priestesses, the ascended masters, that's how they, they knew how to heal. And that's how they knew how to, how to co-create, how they knew how to travel between timelines. They understood that their, their body was quantum in that they could coexist uh, here and in another lifetime at the same time, or they could, you know, like uh, uh, energetically be at two or three different places at the same time. That comes from mastery of the body and the understanding what the full potential of our human body is. Now, most of us don't, don't quite get to there, but that in essence, to me, the way I see it is what an ascended master is. Uh-huh. They have a full awakening and knowing, of course, of their, of their eternalness, of their soul, of their, you know, all that but also of how the instrument works. And they have full control of that instrument. And in yoga, too, I know uh, through, you know, a lot of the practices in the ancient yogis, they do have to train their body to, you know, to, to not breathe, but still be alive, to levitate, to do all these things, because it was, it's part of, it's part of the mastery is this. It's understanding what your full what your full potential is and um, just how powerful you are through like through the body, through your instruments, through your thinking, through the vibrational tone that you put out with your voice, with your words, with your resonance that you are energetic and you're always putting out a resonance frequency. And through that frequency, you're a magnet that you're attracting things to you. It's the full understanding of all those things. Yeah, it's uh, it's interesting. At the end of the second sutras, uh, Patanjali says that, that you're learning how to master your senses. And from, through everything that I've experienced, and I still haven't mastered that yet, you know, it's not still a practice. But the more you really hone in on the subtle body too, the more you realize you first start to acknowledge how much your senses are actually mastering you and you're not mastering your senses. And so you learn how to then take that step. And how many people do we see that are afraid? They're afraid of sensation. They're afraid, but that's what these beautiful ancient practices are teaching you is how to actually understand you are in full. I mean, Patanjali even says like future pain can be avoided future if, if you learn how to and i know the third and fourth part of they get into like the siddhis what we call in yoga is siddhis and i'm a bad lady for ta- even talking about them because we're not supposed to even talk about them but if you read a lot of like ram das's books i think it's even in one of bhagavan das's book where they talk about maharaji their guru they literally witnessed him making food multiply the way that yashua mm-hmm. did in the bible they made he made apples multiply um, there was one scene, I think it was Ram Das, maybe it was Bhagavan Das was driving in India and Maharaji was in the passenger seat beside them and they were having a chit chat and they looked, right, looked over and he was gone. And then a few minutes later, he was back again. He mm-hmm. learned how to control because the nature is, and we've talked about this, Stephanie, it's like in the Western world, we've been taught that our body is just our body. If you get cancer, if you get all this kind of stuff, it's just your, it's just your body. You inherit it, whatever. Whereas when you get into the Eastern philosophy, you realize actually it's your energy. Yeah. That subtle part of you that is manifesting these things within yourself. And, and that's what you're learning to control is that it's like a glove. It's like the hand in the glove Uh is what's controlling the glove. The glove is just glove. That energy is that hand. I think too, you know, we're so programmed to think, you know, externally, like what, what we see is what we believe. And it it goes far beyond that. And I wanted to bring up the whole, how half Thor could be in two worlds at once, because that was something I was very um, interested in actually asking you, Cindy was what I was reading about was she had this lifetime on earth, but she also was simultaneously in Syria or the Syrian planet. Um, also 
I don't know if she went back and forth or she was simultaneously uh, living two different lifetimes, two different timelines together. But that impressed me. Um, and uh, I mean, we, we've been so lied to that these things are literally and they're, they're possible. And I think these are things we're going to probably start learning about in the future and everything like that. But um, I don't know if you know more about that where she was in between Earth and the Syrian planet. Well, the, yeah, the, the way I understand it in the, the book is she, she did have a, a, a human experience uh, and that it was back along like before Atlantis, before Lemurian time. Mm -hmm. And it was during one of the golden ages where the, the people that were on this planet had more of an understanding of things that we're not quite as awakened to yet. So, you know, I think that we're awakening to. And a lot of that information was just simply more available. Yeah. And because in her uh, human experience, she had uh, an understanding of the fact that we're quantum beings through the electron. If you go through the Sophia code, her, one of her activations is she activates all the electrons within your body. And electrons are quantum particles that travel almost at the speed of light. I, I, I actually researched this before for a video that I did. Our electrons don't quite travel at the speed of light, but they almost travel at the speed of light. If our electrons traveled at the speed of light, we wouldn't be in form. <laughs> But they, they come really close to that. And then we have trillions and trillions and trillions of them within the body. And the way that uh, uh, Hathor explains it in the book is that that's the first vehicle to our soul. Like our higher, our higher self extends through every single electron in our body. And if we could just like awaken and remember that. Yeah, that is what gives us the capacity to understand ourselves more as these quantum beings through the physical body, you know, through the through the energetic body, then also through the the our resonance through our voice, through actual vibration and sound, mm -hmm. um, and through just like our our heart, you know, our heart chakra. And when she was on Earth. That was what she was known for. She was she was known for that. That was that that was her like her highest teaching. And uh -huh. yeah, and eventually, yes, she and, and and that's what also gave her the capacity to exist within different that's amazing. like uh, herself here, herself there. Um, she was uh, no, it was uh, it was Isis who was more of an oracle of the earth. But anyway, she had um, she just that she had that that potential, and uh, and what uh, was interesting to it in this book is Mother Mary is also uh, a teacher of your voice, and that she Mother Mary also understood Hathor, like this this these these specific teachings of Hathor. Um, about our bodies, about truly awakening the voice and uh, to let our voice be a representation of our higher self and that this is one of, uh, so you got your collarbone and that this space right here. And if you tone to it, you know, if you hum to it, you can feel a vibration that's coming through. And that's like a gateway, a gateway to you know, massive creation. And yeah, so Hathor like knew, knew this. She knew the intimate mm -hmm. details of all of this and passed on that knowledge in her while she was on Earth. And then, the, um, yeah, and how it translates over into, you know, her being the Egyptian goddess the way we know her. Um, you know, she would come in with Kind of like these horns, I didn't see her like the horns and this, you know, she, she had like a disc in the horns and 
Uh, she would manifest through this. She was known like a, the cow goddess. But that was also her shape shifting. Like Isis was a shape shifter as well, and you would see her with her feathers. And, you know, Hathor was a shape shifter, and they would capture her like the, the cow goddess. But also the goddess of fertility, of abundance, of um, all these things as well. That's how it passed on through the, you know, just the more traditional mm-hmm. line. Now, Hathor was also a major um, influence in Isis, correct? Like she taught Isis a lot of what Isis knew. Is that accurate? That's the way I understand it. Yeah, that, that Hathor was in essence first. And then Isis learned the, the teachings of Hathor. And in the, the addition line, they got um, enough. Like Hathor and Isis kind of became one. Even though they were two separate, you know, a lot of their their stuff got uh, got enough. And sometimes you will see uh, Isis with the same disc. Like Isis has a disc, Castor has a disc because their their teachings actually got enmeshed with one another. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. You know, it's interesting. They want us to think that shape shifting is something that's bad. You know, I'm glad you're bringing this up. Bad, the let lizard people do it, all that kind of stuff. But we're all we all have that ability. We yes. all have the now. Granted, if I I've said it on my my channel before, like if I was going to shape shift anything, it would be for me to constantly have a six pack without having to exercise. No, I'm just kidding. But, um, but, uh, but no, it's, we all have that ability. And if you think about it, like the, the rate in which like you can, we do change. You can tell when someone's upset, that's a, your shape shifts by the energy of being upset by being angry. You already see that happening. And our body is constantly in a state of evolving and changing. That's why it's nature. It's always going to change because it's, it has a, it has an expiration date, but I want to get back to being uh, the idea of being in two places at once. Now, this is something that I knew about long before the great awakening started. Because this is a a topic of conversation that comes up a lot with the law of one, with the Cassiopeians. And I myself have been told by many people that I am personally existing on this earth plane and in the galactics. I've been told that by multiple, that my, a, a part of myself is also in the galactics right now, existing in that higher plane of existence, you know, but me and my lower self, I'm like, I don't know, you know, what's she doing up there? I don't know. <laughs> what does her outfit look like? I don't know, you know, but um, I hope it's pretty. <laughs> <laughs> but that is something that I have, especially for what they say for, I don't want to say more evolved souls. I don't think that's, I don't think that's necessarily the case, but more of a uh, souls that are maybe used to being in a place where they've been more of like a, a warrior type in the sense of like, they have a job to do. And so a fractal of that soul will decide to come down to the earth plane while another fractal will stay up in, you know, another realm and be doing something else. And sometimes we know with the concept of twin flames that a soul can split into two bodies as well, but yet in the quantum those twins are always together. The souls are all, they're never apart from each other. And so it's this mind blowing concept for us, mortal, mere mortal humans that are dealing with a mere mortal brain. You know, the mm-hmm. brain, we talk about this in yoga a lot. The brain is just a, a muscle. It's just an organ, like the heart. It has a job to do in your sure survival, but you also have your consciousness and your psyche and all these things together make up your own thought process. But when we start, start to separate the way we analytically look at something, you can actually feel the difference where the brain can't possibly understand this because the brain recognizes patterns. The brain is looking to survive. The brain is trying to figure out what's going to keep you on this earth plane alive. Whereas the consciousness, though, if you shift it, your consciousness can kind of understand it, you know, can kind of go, oh, yeah, that resonates. Like, yeah, that actually resonates. The first time somebody said that to me, I was like, yeah, that kind of makes sense. I don't understand it, but that kind of makes sense. There's something that resonates. Um, And I think part of this great awakening is, you know, the brain, the analytical brain does have a purpose. It does have a very important purpose. You wouldn't be able to drive a car without it, you know, like you wouldn't be able to like feed yourself without it or survive, but to be able to kind of flip the awareness to more of that conscious state of understanding the quantum more. And that's something that we've kind of been robbed of, of too in this timeline. Mm-hmm. Because we weren't, 
my parents didn't talk to me about this. Like we didn't grow yeah. up in school learning about this. So, you well, know, part of the great awakening is entering this Christ consciousness state where, you know, it's not just understanding that we've been lied to our whole lives, but it's like, there's these gifts and powers that have been completely hidden from us um, in that we're going into a different state of consciousness. So I think going forward, we'll eventually start to remember these things. If we had these abilities in a past life or whatnot, um, I don't know what your um, take is on that, um, you guys, but um, I'm thinking that we will start to remember things as we shift into the fourth density positive, but that fifth density consciousness, the Christ consciousness. Well, you know, we have, we, you know, a lot of us, and I, you know, I've done it through my work, we have the capacity to ask, access different parts of our lives, our, our past lives. Mm-hmm. Like, yeah. I've done yeah. past life regressions, you know, past life regression myself, past life regressions with people where you begin to access memories of when you existed within mm-hmm. another, you know, within another lifetime or another timeline. And that's pretty well known, like you can access yeah. your past life. And what's really fascinating is um, this is a, a, a personal practice, too, that I often share. You know, I've done it myself, but I'll share it with, with some students or some clients, is to access your future self. Especially because your future self has different potentials, too, you know, based off of the decisions that you're making right now will decide which part of your future self actually activates and this and that. Um, but if you're in the process of really a manifesting or, or creating or, or, or just really wanting to create the, the life that you want to create, well, there's a timeline for that. Like you can, you can transport yourself to your future self that has all the things. And to ask that future self to come in and to communicate with your present self and give you the information that it needs to get you there. So, you know, that, like that's a practice that you can, that you can use instead of always going in the past. Now, you know, sometimes we have to unravel our past, yeah. to unravel it from our body to disentangle it so that we're not, we're not living or we're not frozen in the past. But then you can also connect to your future self mm-hmm. and connect with that, that timeline where in, in that future where um, you've already done the thing. You know, you've yeah. already got the thing. You've already created the thing. And then ask that future self to come in and to, to give you the, the roadmap as to how to get there. Now, that would require a lot of shadow work um i'm assuming um wouldn't it well, to, I was about to say, shadow work comes in for the um uh disentangling pieces of your past yes that's usually the, the, the shadow work is a lot of the inner child stuff yeah a lot of subconscious where we're fragmented and we're still caught in our trauma drama mm-hmm. all that stuff usually your your shadow takes you to your past to free you from that for your body because yeah. all that stuff gets stuck in your body and that's why I think that's also part of, of the process of, ma- of mastering our bodies we got to shed it from where it's traumatized or frozen in the past there's a book out there you know honestly I haven't read the book because I feel like I would read the book and go yes 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 correct 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 um your body holds the score yeah I've read it have what is this book again? Okay. It's intense. It what is book? really um your um your body keeps the score. It is okay. intense. Yes. Is that something somebody could purchase on uh, Amazon yeah. or something? It's mm-hmm. really intense. Um, it gets into how your body holds on to things, but it's interesting. So, Doctor Brian Wise, most people know who he is. Who are in the spiritual world? He was one of the first big hypnotherapists, uh, doctors who accidentally stumbled upon uh, learning how to bring people into past life regression. Um, he's written his first book, I think was called many minds, many masters. I can't remember the exact, I read his first book when I was in college. And at that point, reincarnation was something my grandmother kind of briefly spoke to me about like whispered because we didn't want our Christian family to hear. We were talking about that. 
Um, she, she was great. I've told people much. She used to hide books on reincarnation under the bed for my grandfather. But, um, but she, and so I started reading this book in college and, and I was like, this is so fascinating. And he's written so many books on the subject. He's talked about all his different clients and he can study karmically uh, patterns in people and how they've kind of translated through each life. And again, your karma, I've said this over and over and over again for the Westerners in the back of the room who don't understand what karma is. All karma is, is action and reaction. It's your work. That's all it is. That's all it is. And there was one book though, where he was starting to take people into their future lives. He was starting to do this with his clients. And a lot of the times, and one client I remember he spoke about in particular, is there were two future lines simultaneously available to that person. And it all depended on whether the person in this particular life did their shadow work or not. Mm -hmm. If they didn't work through their karma in this life, they were going to have to take this path. If they did, they did the work, then this path would open up. One path, and I, I'll never forget the next life. I remember it was this this woman was going to now be a man living in Hawaii in a beautiful home, was going to have a very peaceful life. But the other possibility was a really hard life for her. And then, but it all depended on what she did now in the here and now yeah. with her own karma. Her own. And so that yeah. shadow work is it, you can't. And you know, our souls are eternal, so God doesn't mm -hmm. care how long it takes. Like you can repeat the second grade as many times as you want to, cause you're not dying anyway. So, mm -hmm. so, you know, universe is like, if you got to do a hard life again, just to work through this crap, we'll just keep giving you that hard life, but it's up to you what you're willing to face in this life. And that's going to determine the trajectory of which path is simultaneously available to you. Yep. Now, if we talk about the multiverse, there could be two different lives you're living in this life where in one instance you do the work and once instance you don't and so you're sold and takes two separate journeys that gets into a whole other discussion of the multiverse mm -hmm. and the existence of you living even on the same plane in different existences but it's mm -hmm. all for you to learn for this what is it um alan watt says it's it's like the eyeball trying to see itself it's like the, the soul really trying to understand itself which it, it's, it's, it's almost as David Greed, you say like it almost like the uh, unsolvable riddle because it's so complex, you know, and for our, yeah. our little mortal lives, it's just, you know, it starts to wrap itself around all those, those ideas. And that's why often through uh, sessions or, you know, clearing sessions that I do, you clear through all dimensions, all realities, all timelines, through all space, time dimensions and reality, because there are, and not only that, but the, the way then how that just continues to roll, to roll over into, um, how it can impact, uh, your unborn children. Mm -hmm. Because it, it, it goes out. It has a rippling effect that goes out beyond simply you. It yep. ripples out to your, your future line. Yep. You know, you are, and, and all of them who come after you. So it's just, yeah, it's mind blowing when you think My, about how we were talking about this yesterday, Stephanie, about we were talking about like about men having to like grow up and be dads. And they have you said, oh, they have nine months to prepare. I'm like, no, no, no. The minute that sperm hits that egg, that sperm is holding a vibrational frequency. That man needs mm -hmm. to like get his shit together before. So that sperm's vibration when it hit and the mm -hmm. woman for the egg, too. Um, yeah. I mean, every kid is, every kid's going to have some type of parent issue like that. That's just yeah. being human, you know, but you want to try to, but it's true. Cause think about how much crap we're holding on to from our ancestors. And we don't even understand that it comes from some ancestor that lived 500 years ago. That's just passed trickled down through yeah. energetic it line. Does. It really does. Yeah. yeah. So mind blowing. Yeah. It's absolutely mind blowing. Reality future self, past self, unborn children. I mean, it just, we ripple mm -hmm. in so many different directions for sure. No pressure, people, no pressure. <laughs> it's a lot to take in. It really is. And especially like, you know, I just came out of the, the Christian church. So this is like, <laughs> yeah. you know what I mean? Like learning about all this stuff and, I mean, it's quite liberating at the same time. I'm, I'm glad I'm out of that world because that is a very harsh world to be a part of. Um, 
And it's, you lose your, your sense of self when you are in that world, because they don't want you to know your powers and everything. But, um, you know, learning about all these ascended masters and everything, it's, it's been a subject of interest with me, especially um, the lineage of ISIS and all of that. And um, so that's why I wanted to bring in um, this whole Hathor video, because I know they're very interconnected in um, a lot of the stuff that they did and um, the teachings and all that kind of stuff. So it was very, very fascinating for me. And I, I'm very fascinated with the whole thing that Hathor was simultaneously living in two different worlds. I think that's, oh, that's mind blowing right there. But apparently um, we still have those abilities to do that. Um, you might but, be too, Stephanie, at this and Cindy might be as well, that your soul is living in two different worlds. I wouldn't be shocked. I wouldn't be shocked <laughs> at this point. Nothing really shocks me. <laughs> so I, I always say, and we were texting today. I mean, in, in the, in the, in the West, we're just basically taught the soul. Like that's what we're spirit. Yeah. Soul, that's what we're taught is that eternal. But then you get into the teachings of the East and you've got, and for them, the soul, I typically say soul. Cause that's what, cause I'm speaking mostly to Westerners. And so that's what Westerners understand is that eternal part of us. But then you get to the East and they believe that the soul isn't even the, the real eternal part of you, that you can have multiple souls within you from all your different lives you've lived. It's like a residue from all those. So you could be walking around with like 1500 souls from all these lives you've lived in your one body, that the real essence of the eternal, even gets down to Atman, something that's even deeper than the soul, this idea of Atman, which then connects to Brahman, which is one of, you know, big in India, it's Brahma. Brahma is one of the, the tri heads of, of the deity. So it gets, it gets so, so detailed, so detailed into who we really are, the essence of who we really are. And one thing I love about the Isis um, and Hathor teaching is the role of women. Because I think most people know the name Isis over Osiris. And Osiris was mm -hmm. her male consort, but People know ISIS probably thanks to, you know, McCain and his bandits of, uh, <laughs> we won't say much on that guys, you know what we're talking about, but they, they like to, they like to dirty those names up. Um, but people know ISIS more than they know Osiris. The women at, in this time were respected as sovereign beings who actually were more than just a housewife with a pretty face that they had babies. You know, that there was such a huge shift from these powerful women that people went to for healing, um, mm -hmm. went to as, as a, we even see, we've talked about this, Cindy, you've mentioned this a lot about even with Magdalene and Yahshua, she anointed him. Mm -hmm. you don't ask somebody to anoint you unless you view them as, as spiritually superior to you. Mm hmm. And he had yeah. her anoint him. He asked Magdalene to do it. He didn't ask Peter or John or, you know, Larry down the street. Like he asked Magdalene to do it with her mm. alabaster jar. And so. Yeah. And um, it's funny too that when you begin to connect and study with the with it with these ascended masters, the way that they, they come through you. I mean, they, they will really with you. I, I shared recently on the Instagram because uh, I'm running right now uh, the Ascension course where we're actually working with the female Ascended Masters. And I was sharing how when I, you know, can come up with a date for the program that I run, I come up with a date purely because it fits on my schedule well. That's it. There's no other motivation. I was like, I look at my schedule and I say, okay, we're going to do this date, this date, this date, this date, right? And then, uh, as, as we know, you know, we just well, went through Holy Week. And uh, this past Saturday, we had one of the classes scheduled for Ascension. And, of course, it was Mother Mary, Mary, Mary Magdalene who we had scheduled. And it, it happened to fall on the full moon in Libra, which, you know, Libra is ruled by Venus. And I didn't, I didn't plan that. Well, some some part of my consciousness planned that, but like I didn't consciously plan that. But the way that these teachings and these teachers and the, these ascended masters will just come in and will show up in your life this way, giving you the synchronicities and the affirmations that yes, we are, yes, we are here with you. And I think that that's one of the, the big things that, that we can take away 
from this as, as well is that they are here with you and that they will work with you and that they will show up in your lives in very meaningful transformational ways that, you know, truly, truly make a difference that they don't only exist in theory because, you know, when, when we talk about this like this, you know, we, we talk about the theory, the philosophy, but they don't only exist in the realm of theory, that they exist in the realm of showing up for you in your real life and, uh, and, and uh, bringing the messages home and truly embodying them. And that is, and that is so true with, with, with all of, with all of these, with, with Hathor, and, and they just like sneak in and they give you all these little divine links through the synchronicity saying, yes, you know, we're, we're here. Again, we don't just exist here in the world of you talking about us, but we will really come in, come through you. And the, the more you study with them, the more you the more you take, you take in, the more you become initiated. The more you actually become uh, the chalice yourself, the vessel, the channel, and your words are their words. You're, you're, well, you become one. It's like their words are your words. It's like you've opened yourself up to, to their wisdom, their knowledge, and to everything that they have to share. And you said one time, Cindy, and I loved it that they don't, they don't want to be worshipped. You know, they don't want to be. It's almost like they're there to show you right that you are also an ascended master. Yeah. Also, you, you can also do this. You are, they want to be embodied mm -hmm. through you. It's like they want to be embodied and to like really be here on this earth plane, showing up to anybody who's open and willing to, to do it. And it's that, I mean, you have to be open and willing. You have to be willing to do the work mm -hmm. because uh, it, with any kind of initiation, no matter what study you're going in, it's going to require you to do your work. So the yeah. willingness yeah. to to do your work and the, to then become become the vessel. You have to become the chalice and become the embodiment. That's what they want. They want you to be an embodiment of what they've been, you know, the, of their wisdom, of their teaching. Yeah. Somebody asked me, and I can't remember if it was in an email or if it was in a comment. Um, somebody asked me, what does one have to do to be initiated? into the priesthood of Isis or this Hathor or whatever it's called now, you know, what does one have to do to become that? It's the good of it to find someone who's already gone through it. So an um, initiator, you know, someone who's uh, spent, spent years with it and it, it'll, it'll just work better. Um, you can I mean, totally go through and you know, say it frequently, you can totally go through these processes on your own. I mean, you really can. You have the capacity to do that, but to have someone that helps you through it, it's much better for when the shit hits the fan and you have someone know. that you can go to because it will it will have been like the unraveling of the old will happen. Yep. And when that happens, to have someone who can just be a con or you know, or have something or someone. Uh, a container to help you get through through like those moments and uh, to just help to I don't know to guide you along and to act as a catalyst for it instead of trying to do everything on your own you you can call do things by yourself but it's better to do things not by yourself well you know, sometimes the teacher have, will will trigger the karma to come up faster I mean, that's yes, friend exactly. who is a certified Ashtanga teacher, one of the like 17 women in the world who are certified because it's so hard. And she's, she said that before, like your karma is laid out for you in this life already. Mm -hmm. But when you pick a practice like Ashtanga or a spiritual practice, an intense mm -hmm. old practice that runs by a very ancient set of rules, you're actually asking to have your karma sped up. You're yeah, asking exactly. for that's it all, all, this, all this stuff that's all, uh, I was, Telling this with somebody, I mean, maybe it was with you, Bryce. All we're doing, all we're doing, is saving you time, mm -hmm. so that you don't have to go through your four or five or six lifetimes. Uh, like you said, you know, God really doesn't care. 
but you might care because you might be tired of feeling shitty or feeling stuck or feeling like you don't know where you're going, you know, and you want to uh, enhance your life now, this life. And so your teachers, they just act as catalysts to save you time. That's all we do. All we do is save you time. Yeah. It's a controlled demolition. I mean, I was having a conversation with that um, at, at your at your school, Cindy, with a student of ours saying this is a controlled demolition when you're in the, especially when the, with the yoga ashtanga practice, the practice itself and a lot of, of old uh, spiritual practices are designed to piss you off. They're mm -hmm. designed to trigger you. They're designed for a controlled demolition of your false sense of self to get to the root of who you are. You got to, you got to take down the fake plaster before you can actually yeah. view the gold underneath. And that's not mm -hmm. fun. That's the one thing I'm trying. Cause I think sometimes here in the West, more so in the East, um, we are really confused about that. I find a lot of people think when they take on a spiritual path, that it's going to be just Enya music and like, you know, lavender scents you're just going to be farting lavender i don't know it's just going to be <laughs> it's just going to be and i'm like ah, no, rainbows that's not that's not happened once maybe, like, <laughs> maybe next life like, like, this is farting lavender i was highly impressed i know i have not happened i'm highly impressed too i'm like no it is it is one of the most painful things you will ever go through and that's when people i i find it myself anyway with my students when um when the stuff really starts to come up, when the shit hits the fan, that's when people run and they don't want to do it anymore. And they go back to their old habits because it's too hard. And it's not their, you know, it's, it's not their expectation of what they held in their mind about what a spiritual journey was going to look like. And it's, it's, it, 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 it becomes worth it when you start to work through that stuff because you learn so much about yourself and you, you find out who your sense of self is. But um, yeah, it's, it's, and those teachers are not going to coddle you. They're not going to yeah, help you through that too. Yeah. You know what I mean? And th that's where it's good to have, a, uh, have teachers is when you get to that point where you're like, oh my gosh, I want to stop. But you have a space and you have like a container, you know, to do the work. It's, um, you're, you're more likely to go through it and to show up and to, you know, to process and to, to get to the other side of it. Where if you're just doing it by yourself, you might not be as motivated or you might not keep the momentum to keep going. I that's agree with that. Teachers, initiators, you know, your priestesses, all this, that's where, that's, that's, that's just what we do is, is we're holding, we're holding the space for that, um, for you to, to do it. Because and, 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 it's not like we're here figuring it out for you. Mm -hmm. no, you're still figuring it out for yourself. Like we, we can provide you with, with the guidance. We can provide you with maybe some of the initial energetic initiations and, you know, be there, but you, you still have to, yeah, you, you still have to go through it yourself. You have to do the work and, and we're, that's basically what we do is we just hold the space for you to be able to, to do it. Holding accountability. Well, and people ask yeah. me that a lot, especially in the mice war room, which is do not at Cindy's uh, a school. I just teach a leg class, but in the mice war room um, for traditional Ashtanga, there's constantly somebody on their mat crying. There's constantly somebody having a breakdown and it's not because, I mean, the practice is hard, but that's nothing compared to what it's pulling up in that person. And every single teacher I've worked with and the way I handle it too in the mice room is when somebody's having a breakdown on their mat, I don't draw attention to them. I just let them have their space. And once they're get them, once they get themselves together, they resume their practice again. And then I continue helping them through their practice. Most teachers will not draw attention to it. I, I remember one time um, I was up in Philadelphia practicing and there was a girl beside me who every day she was just struggling through this third series transition, which if y'all third series is like circus sleigh anyway, but you know, she was really, you could tell it was really triggering her and you would see her just, you would hear her dropping F bombs. That's most my store rooms. You hear the F bomb all the time. It's no big deal. Um, Cause people are triggered and they're, they're working through stuff. And then one day, like four days into my time there, she just like sat on her mat and just started sobbing, just sobbing. Mm -hmm. And we all just continued practicing and David continued walking around the room. And then once she got her 
act together and took that deep breath. David came and sat on the map beside her and just said, y'all good now? And she said, yep. He was like, all right, let's get back up and keep going. Mm-hmm. And that's all it took, you know? And so I cried on my map this morning. You're not there to help solve their problems. Like you solve it yourself. Yeah. But we yeah. might give a little extra something. You're going to hold the space. If you have questions, answering the questions, that yeah. kind of a thing. But, you know, we're not here to fix you or yeah. to do anything like that. We're just here simply to, you know, again, hold the, hold the container, be the container. And I'll only, leave. go ahead. And right. yeah. I say it's a safe space. It's a safe space to fall apart. It's a safe space, and mm-hmm. uh, that's because it's expected. And uh, sometimes people feel crazy when it starts to happen to them. But the teachers are to go. Actually, this is really normal. That's happened to me, Bryce. I I called you. I'm like, I don't know what's going on. I just did this bar exercise, and I can't stop crying. <laughs> and so I, I've been learning this firsthand for the first time in my life. Like I I've worked. I used to be. Uh, a crazy person with working out uh, two hours uh, a day for six days, seven days a week when I was like really, really young, but in the gym and I wasn't working any of my pelvic floor area, my hips, none of that, like solar plexus area. And now that I'm working that with the bar exercising, like this morning, I really lost it. And I felt a lot of, I actually had a lot of like flashbacks of my childhood, things that made me angry come up. And I didn't run away from it. I faced it head on and I just remembered it. And I said, okay, well, and I, I allowed myself to cry it out and, and really faced it and everything and understanding why that particular issue has created me to act maybe certain ways in my adult life, you know, why, mm-hmm. um, and learning a lot from you, Bryce, when it comes to this kind of stuff, I was able to, uh, productively, face that and do that shadow work head on. And, but I felt so much better afterward. I, I it was uncomfortable. I don't like crying. I, I talk about this all the time. I was always told a lot of times, don't cry, don't cry. So I've, that's, that's a programming I have to release now. And so, um, but you have to release it. You have to face it and you can't run away from it because it's going to just follow you and follow you and follow you. I mean, it's just you. It's you that you're facing. Mm-hmm. Yep. You know what I mean? That's like people think, oh my gosh, I'm going to say something that I can't. It's, it's you. It's a part of you. It's a you that was stuck or frozen, a child or something that felt hurt. And we fear that. We fear facing that. But it's you, you know, it's just you that you're facing and our ego makes it so much bigger than that. Like, no, you can't go there because, you know, we, 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 we cultivate these protective mechanisms to keep us from going to those places because they caused trauma before. Mm-hmm. And you're that those, those part of me, those mechanisms of protection, they do a really great job of making you very afraid of looking at those things. But they're just you. They're little big you. They're like they you, little two, three year old you. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Or Eleven year old you. And um, that, that only, they just want to be heard and acknowledged and seen, you know, and it's through that process that we can regain and become a whole, like those, those pieces that we have fragmented, we can bring them back into our souls. We don't feel, we don't feel, I mean, we can't ever be fragmented, but we, we do a good job of, of in, in our bodies, fragmenting pieces of ourselves so that we don't feel whole. You know, and that's what the, the, this does is it brings all those pieces back to you and you can bring that part of you back into your heart or into your solar plexus or into wherever, wherever you disassociated it from. Mm-hmm. But, um, they're just, they're, they're just your emotions. Mm-hmm. You know, they're, they're simply your emotions and they're you. That's, that's what you're facing. Mm-hmm. But we make our, our, that our, our, Protective mechanisms do a really good job of making us really afraid of facing those things. Mm-hmm. It's not easy, but mm-hmm. it's so beneficial to do that work. So beneficial. And we like to project. Yeah. We like to, and, and as I say this, guys, I'm generalizing. If you are in a situation where you are being abused, please get out of it. 
But if we go back and look at, because I know I've been through that, Stephanie's been through that, we've all been through that situation. We want to project all of those issues onto the person who did it to us. But when you're really on the spiritual path, you go, wait a minute, I was doing that to myself. What yep. part of me, we were talking about magnifying, attracting, what part of me wasn't healed? That was the best thing that happened to me in my life is I had gone through one bad relationship to the next bad relationship to the next bad relationship with narcissists to the point where I almost lost my life. It got so bad where I almost lost. I had to call 911. I got, you know, I can't say it on YouTube, but this and the dog actually, I actually thought I was, I mean, the dog pooped on the floor and that's when they, I was dropped and I reached for my phone and called 911. It was bad, but I had to get all the way to that point for me to go, why am I attracting this? Yeah, and that's right. sending into trauma therapy. And also to mm -hmm. India where I took a lot of time alone and I went through trauma therapy and I had a great, I know people feel funny about therapists. I had a great trauma therapist. She was very well educated in Eastern philosophy and she, you know, would walk you through things. And we did EMDR therapy to also relax the, the, the mind a little bit, but, but just being able to face that part of myself from my childhood that mm -hmm. wasn't healed. And if something mm -hmm. isn't healed, it's going to keep screaming out at you. And attracting something to get your attention before you actually heal heal it. Mm -hmm. And after that happened, after I went through that, I all of a sudden was able to date men that showed me actual love because yeah. I started to love myself. I actually found mm -hmm. myself in healthy relationships that I had never been in before. All of a sudden, yeah. look at that. This is a, all of a sudden you're in a healthy, you know, and it's, 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 um, so it is beneficial. It's hard though. It really sucks, especially when you've gone through something like that and you're like, wait a minute, this is on me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. When I was a child, I didn't have a chance to, you know, but now I'm in, and that's what my, one thing my therapist said to me, you mm -hmm. are responsible for that little girl. You mm -hmm. are now responsible for her. And mm -hmm. by not healing this, you're doing to her what you feel like your parents did to you. You're just right. picking up that role. And it is, it's you facing yourself. It's all you. It's mm -hmm. liberating when you, and then, it is. Mm -hmm. then you go through the idea of the soul contract that you actually agree for these things to happen. So you would have the opportunity to learn and grow. And I know people get upset with that, but honestly, when you actually realize that you were the, you were the writer of that contract, that you were the one that said, I'm going to do this in this life. Whoa, that's powerful. Yes. Mm -hmm. that's, that's very powerful. liberating to understand that. And I always have said to that, how did I, how do I word this? I always say some of the greatest things that come to us in life come with the hardest work. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Nothing good. You is know what I mean, no, nothing good is easy. And, but, but look at it in a sense where when you do that hard work, you are going to feel like a million bucks compared to if you did nothing about it. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? There is a sense of like, I don't want to say reward. I don't want to come off like um, egotistical, um, but like it's it's like a humble pat on the back. Like, okay, I did this. I'm proud of myself. And you gain this uh, love for yourself that you couldn't if you didn't do anything about it. Does that make sense? Well, self-respect too. Yeah. It builds, your, it builds a confidence inside of you that, um, and which is where that is it's part of the actual feeling of empowerment is mm -hmm. that it's yes. where you can say hey, you know here i am i <laughs> i did this and that confidence empowerment all those things you know they reside right there at your solar center mm -hmm. and it builds you up you know but it builds you up from from the inside out from restoring all those misplaced pieces where we we disassociated them or put them somewhere you put the piece back and it's like, you know, you grow, you grow bigger, taller, uh, stronger, for sure. Yeah. You learn, you said this, Stephanie, too, you, you learn, and that's the thing about the sense of self, you learn not to look for your sense of self outside of you. Yes. And that's the big, that goes even beyond love, is just understanding that you have a sense of self of who you are that's beyond what your favorite food is, what your favorite color is. It's something that's so sacred that's yours. And once you find that sense of self and you're able to settle into that sense of self, you can be alone and be fine. Mm -hmm. You're not looking for another person to fulfill you. You're not looking for another thing to fulfill you. 
I mean, I, Ram Dass even said this once, and I thought this was brilliant that one day you don't even need the spiritual practices anymore because you found what you were looking for, you know, Mm -hmm. and that's, that's the beauty of it. And that goes beyond so much of what we even perceive about ourselves is, is resting in that sense of self. And I think a lot of times children do have a sense of self, but then through the um, haphazard obstacle of being human, things get knocked out of them. And all of a sudden we are a little fragmented and disassociated. And then we're adults running around with, with wounds from our childhood that we're just trying to cover up a mask when actually it's never been gone in the first place. It was always there. We just have to go and mm-hmm. find it again. And I think oh. that like Hathar, Isis, all these ascended masters had to also work through this as well, well to get where they were to have an understanding oh. of, of the um, predicament of being human. Mm-hmm. You're restoring your talent. Mm-hmm. You got to restore it, restore your talent. And then it can hold the, the higher you can hold your higher consciousness better like your you resonate with your higher consciousness better once you restore restore your talents and I think that's why you know that's what Hathor that's what some what I feel at least in in, in my part of it you know I think you know, different different teachers might have a different perspectives as to what their piece is in what they're offering in teaching. But the one that comes through most powerfully for me is that is restoring your power, mm-hmm. restoring your body, restoring your humanity, doing doing your shadow work, doing all all this stuff, doing your exercises, eating well. I mean, because all that all that contributes. So doing the bar, doing the yoga, doing making sure your muscles. Or supporting, I mean, I mean, go through the true, not just the energetic, but you got to go through the, the physiological. I mean, you, you need to go through understanding your nervous system, understanding, um, yeah, the, your, your bone structure, your muscle structure, how you can support to that, your senses. I mean, taking it beyond the just the energetic, but to the physical, because it all, of course, it all comes up. Mm-hmm. Um, and restoring your talents. I mean, that's really what I feel like, like I do. That's what I help people with that is what mine, the way these masters come in through me is, uh, is to offer that kind of those words and uh, uh, that kind of support to, to help in that. Yeah. When is your so, next yeah. ascended uh, master's workshop, Cindy? Do you have dates for it yet? No, uh, or uh, two more, um, probably in the fall. Okay. I'll do another one. The thing is, I have to figure out how to do that. Um, we do so much hands-on. That yeah. one I haven't figured out how to put together virtually because we also take field trips. Yeah. You know, we go out and we, we go do different things. But, um, yeah, I'm definitely a feeler. Like, I'm a knower. I'm a feeler. I like to touch people. <laughs> I don't know why I'm being um, called to ask this of you, Cindy, because, you know, in the Ashtanga world, um, teachers travel a lot to do workshops. And actually, David Garee will probably be coming back in the fall. Um, which oh, is yeah. Yeah. And um, but would you ever if there's somebody watching right now, Cindy, that owns a uh, Shala somewhere and wants you to come up and teach a weekend workshop or something on the Ascended Masters, would you be would you be open to traveling? to do that. Yeah, yeah. And I was like, yeah, totally. I would totally be up for that. And I am also trying to get more on the virtual, like, you know, I did the little, or I'm in the middle of doing the the virtual training for the spirit release. Mm -hmm. So, and I do some other, with clients, you know, I have clients from, you know, from all over the place that I do virtually. But I, I think the training part, like really trying to get in and, and train train people, that is where, and I know there's plenty of training virtually, but I guess that Hands I'm. Hands-on is so important, though. Hands-on, it's that energy. It's that it's part of the parampara, so I totally get it. But if there's shallow owners out there that are listening, Cindy's down to travel. <laughs> Thank you for putting that out there. Um, we are over an hour. <laughs> point um cindy i want to thank you so so much for coming out here and explaining um what you know about hathor and then of course bryce you bring in your ashtanga uh 
you know, knowledge and all of your Eastern philosophy knowledge. So I really appreciate it. And like, you guys make such a great team and collaborating and pulling together all that information. You guys are like rock stars. <laughs> you know, with their price, you're like, I know, I know, I got this. At your job. <laughs> Me on my bed with my computer. <laughs> <laughs> my bed with my computer, guys. And we got my lights. I got everything ready. Uh, I just, I just do that. You know, adult entertainment director. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I would never do that. So, but thank you guys so so much for doing this because um, I I know that a lot of people actually have. Been, I've had a lot of people asking me about Hathor specifically lately. I I, I don't know. Maybe it's Hathor season. So, <laughs> but thank you so so much, and um, we'll have to definitely do this again when I come up with a, another subject of interest than a goddess. <laughs> thank you so much for having me and for the invitation. I love it. You're welcome. Of course, as always, Bryce. <laughs> Thank it's you so much. I'll see you Sunday. <laughs> see you Sunday Our for a ton of portraits day. <laughs> 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 Bye. All right, ladies. Bye.